Okay, so here is a uh, little sutta called the Asada Sutta from the numerical discourses, the sixth chapter, the chapter on the sixes, number 112. And Asada means like the um, pleasure, the positive side in things, yeah, called the gratification very often as a common translation for Asada. And uh, what you find in, in the sutta is one of the very interesting little groups of dhammas or qualities that you find in the suttas is the asada, the adinava, and the nisarana. And the three qualities that always go, very often go together in the suttas. And uh, everything in the world can be contemplated in terms of these three things. Uh, asada is the gratification or the positive side of things. Uh, adinava is the danger uh, or the uh, downside or the disadvantage of things. Uh, and nisarana is the escape. And uh, the way these three things work is that when you look at things in the world, you recognize that things often have a gratification. They have a positive side. And because things have a positive side, we are attached to things. And then to dis, uh, disattach or to detach, uh, you have to see the downside, yeah, the adinava. And then when you really understand the downside and you kind of balance up the gratification with the downside, then you... Uh, find the nisarana, you find the escape. Uh, yeah? So these are the three qualities going together. Uh. And so to give you an example, yeah, why is it that sometimes we get upset? Uh? Why does anger arise? Uh? And the reason why anger arises is because there is a gratification in anger. Uh, yeah? Anger sometimes makes you feel more powerful, or it makes you feel, it kind of gives rise to a certain energy that makes you act or whatever. So there's a certain gratification in anger. Uh. But there's also a big downside in anger. Yeah, We understand the downside. That's kind of the adinava. And when you see the downside, well, then you, you recognize that actually maybe I should give up the anger. Maybe it's better to be kind yeah, than to be angry. And I think most of us can see that when it comes to anger. Anger happens too easily. At least we should be less angry. It's kind of obvious. Yeah, The less, the better very often. Huh? And so with anger, it is easy to see. But then you also want to use these things, these particular qualities for other things in life. And we haven't been looking at the, uh, the sensual world or the sensory world. Yeah, the asada in this five sense world is kind of easy to see. Yeah, the pleasure in having a nice house and having a car and having a family. We kind of know the upside of these things. What we don't now know is a downside. Actually, that's a nice translation of asada, upside. This came to me now. Upside is a good translation. Yeah. So maybe I should make a note. Upside. <coughs> Upside is kind of, um, and then you have the downside, right? And then you compare them to compare them with each other. Yeah. What do you think about upside? Is that, <laughs> I'm gonna, gonna test my uh, test the translations on, on you, see what happens when I see upside. Does it work or does it not work? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> then we have downside is the idea. Of that. I reckon it works actually. Yeah. So we know, very often we know the upside of things. What we often don't know is the downside. Uh, and so the downside is what has to be com contemplated. Uh, and then when you weigh things up, you realize the downside is actually the problem. And the upside isn't that great. Uh. So let's have a look at see what the Buddha has to say in this very short sutta, the Asada Sutta. Mendicants, there are these three things. Things are dhamma. They are these three dhammas, these three qualities or three things. What three here? The view that things are gratifying. Yeah? In other words, the view that they have an upside. The view of self and wrong view. These are the three things. So this is kind of a typical sutta. Yeah, the Buddha will set, put together three things, and uh, sometimes it can be hard to see the connection between these things. Uh, but this is kind of what makes the suttas interesting, is that the Buddha sometimes puts things together in new, new ways and shows us new things. Uh. So the view that things are gratifying, yeah? so the, in other words, the view that things have an upside, that there's something positive about them. Uh, and what do we have to do to overcome that? Well, we have to do things like we are doing here, understanding the impermanence, the unreliability, the uncertainty. Uh, now we understand the downside, uh, yeah? The view of self. Uh, uh, what is the view of self here? Uh, Sakaya ditti, maybe? Uh, is it? Uh, 
Atanuditi. Aha, okay, Atanuditi. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Atanuditi. Yeah, Atanuditi. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yes, so the view of self, in other words, is very closely related to the Sakaya Ditti, uh, the view that there is uh, an Atta, and then wrong view. And wrong view is like here probably even broader. It's a very broad idea, all the things that come under wrong view. Uh, so all of these things are very closely related to each other. In some way, they're all wrong view in a particular way. Yeah, uh, Different kinds of wrong view, different versions of it. Uh. So what does the Buddha have to say about this? Uh, to give up these three things, uh, you should develop three things. Uh. So what should we develop to give up the view that things are gratifying? Uh, and I don't think I will not, no one gets any prize for guessing this. Uh, you should develop the perception of impermanence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to give up the view that things are gratifying. This is what we have seen all the way along. They are, uh, here you can argue that gratifying is a bit deeper or maybe a bit more than what we have seen before. Uh, but this is, of course, the idea that the five sense world is interesting and gratifying. Yeah? We're seeing how impermanence can actually overcome that. Uh, but uh, also the gratification and other things like the higher stages of meditation or the sense of self even, uh, yeah, even that kind of gratification we have seen can be overcome by developing the perception of impermanence. So, you do, so this is uh, this uh, anicca sanya. So um, I, you know, one of the things that uh, is really I'm always concerned about when I when we teach the Dhamma is that uh, it gets too much information and too complicated, uh, and there are too many things going on. And then when you I finish this retreat, you don't really know what to do. Uh, yeah, you kind of, uh, okay, so what do I do with all this information? How do I apply this in my life? Yeah, And this is kind of always a danger, having so many suttas and so many hours. Uh, and uh, <laughs> what do you think, Bobby? <laughs> and, so, uh, and so at this point, I just want to maybe, maybe already now, yeah, we have, we're still a long way from the end, but already now kind of make a point about how we should develop the perception of impermanence, yeah? What does it actually, how should we do that in our daily life? And come back to very simple things. Uh, and I would say that there's only one thing that I would really suggest you doing, uh, and that is doing like the death contemplation, yeah? The perception of death. Uh, that is a very, very powerful perception. Uh, and it brings together so many aspects of impermanence in one single contemplation. Uh, and in this way, instead of kind of going back and kind of having all of these ideas floating in your head, not knowing what to do, you have one thing you can focus on. Yeah. And uh, so this is also the case in this particular case here. If you want to overcome the view that things are gratifying, yeah, that is helped a lot by death contemplation because you know that things will come to an end. You know that they're very, it's very limited how far these things are going to be gratifying to you and how far they're going to be helpful for you. So this is uh, so just to kind of make that point straight away. Huh? And uh, if you want to take that further, you can, but that is a very good starting point. Huh? The perception of not self is to be, uh, you give up, sorry, you pr practice the perception of not self uh, to give up the view of self. Huh? Yeah, so the uh, perception of not self. Huh? And uh, this perception is, can be developed in a number of ways, but uh, one of the ways of doing that is the sense that uh, you are not in charge. Yeah? Things happen to you, and you are more the victim of the world than actually being in charge in the world. Uh, and uh, this is, has, has a sense yeah? when you see kind of how kind of things tend to conspire against you. You do your very best, and still things don't work out. You realize that actually it's a, it's a, you, know, you are basically part of this kind of very complex system and there's, very little, there's often very little that you can do to kind of uh, get yourself out of certain situations and certain things. Uh, so understanding not self is understanding that uh, you are a victim of cause and conditions of the world to a very large extent. Uh, that can be quite easy to see, yeah? It's not that hard. Uh, and sometimes one of the ways of seeing this is to look back on your life, look back to what things were like 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, and when I look back on my life where things were 30 years ago, um, that was roughly the time when I became a monk. Yeah, I've been a monk for almost 30 years. Uh, you wouldn't believe it when you met me, but it's true. Uh, it's, uh, 30 years as a monk. Yeah. And um, 
uh, and I think back, and you know, at the time when you become a monk, it's like kind of a big decision in your life to enter monastic life. Uh, and you think back to all the things you have done, uh, and at the time it seems like you are making a decision. Yeah, it seems like yeah, this is the right thing to do, and it feels like yourself kind of puts its tentacles into that decision and say, "I am doing this," uh, and you take credit for making the good decisions in your life. Uh, and of course, becoming a monk is one of the best decisions. Uh, Right? <laughs> Becoming a nun, yeah, one of the best decisions you can do. Huh? And so you take credit for all the good decisions, uh, yeah, or you, whatever else it is that you have done. But then in retrospect, after many decades later, you look back uh, and you start to see all the cause and conditions. Uh, and it starts to look less like you were making the decision, but all of these things were somehow coming together and you kind of just had to do it, uh, right? Uh, that's what it looks like to me now. And now when I think, actually, I probably had to become a monk in this life. I had no choice. I was destined to become a monk. <laughs> and that is a very interesting idea because I, I don't know, I, I gave a talk a long time ago about um, wh why I am a Buddhist monk. And everyone was asking me, why are you a Buddhist monk? Yeah, because you, you come from Norway and they wonder how on earth made you become a Buddhist monk. And fair enough, I can understand why people are curious about that. Uh, and then I decided to kind of write it down. We made a little booklet out of it. The booklet is called Why I'm a Buddhist Monk. It's available on the internet. You can check it out if you want. And it's kind of it's a nice booklet. Many people like, like it, actually. But in that booklet, I make precisely this point, yeah, that when I was young, I was really conceited. I was, you know, maybe still conceited, but I was more conceited then. That's all I know. <laughs> And you think that everything you do is very wise and very smart, and you are the smartest person around and all of these kind of stupid things that you have this idea. And so you choose monastic life. Why? Because Buddhism is the best religion. If you can take Buddhism seriously, well, you've got to be a monk. That's the only way to take it really seriously. So you have all of these ideas. Yeah? And this is kind of how life kind of, uh, kind, of, kind of carries you forward. And then you start to think more clearly about things. You start to think about how you're what kind of person you were when you were young. Uh, you start to think about some of the experiences that I had as a child. Uh, yeah, when I was 12 years old, I wanted to live in the forest by myself in a little hut. Uh, where's that come from? <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? 12 years old don't normally have that uh, fantasy. Yeah, I don't know if your children come to you, Mommy, I want to go and live in the forest in a hut by myself. Is that okay? Can I go now, please? <laughs> I don't know what you will say here. And so and a few things like that, that made me feel maybe... This was more like destiny than actually, you know, actually a free, free choice. Uh, and the more I thought about it, the more obvious it became to me that actually, very likely, uh, I have been a monastic in a past life. Uh, yeah? And don't know where I was a monastic. Maybe, I don't know, maybe Thailand. I don't know, Malaysia, not so many, maybe not Malaysia, but maybe Thailand, maybe Sri Lanka. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe I was a nun in the past life. All of these kind of things are possibilities. It kind of opens up the possibilities radically. And then I realized, well, if I was a monk or a nun in Sri Lanka or Thailand or who knows where in the past life, then the reason I'm a monk, or, or I'm not a nun now, I know that, but I'm a, <laughs> the reason I'm a monk now is because of habit. That is kind of a shock, yeah? Initially, you think that you are a Buddhist monk because you are very smart and intelligent. Uh, the next minute, it's because of habit. <laughs> Fortunately, it's a good habit, right? So it's not a bad habit, at least. That's kind of a nice thing about it. Uh, and the moment you realize it is a habit, it's a kind of scary because then you are on this conveyor belt, yeah? This conveyor belt or river that kind of drives you forward. And you're not making any choices whatsoever. You're just being driven forward by the habits of the past, uh, that is kind of scary at that moment. So going from being very conceited, I became very scared. And then when I became very scared, okay, I better check out these Buddhist teachings properly. So I went to Ajahn Brahm, and he was a Pali teacher at Buddhinyana Monastery in those days. I learned Pali with Ajahn Brahm, and I started to read the suttas uh, and all of these kind of things. And after a while, yes, I, you know, sure, Buddhism is the best. Yeah? So I, I, was kind of, I was happy with that. Uh, Buddhism is the right way to go. Buddhism is about the meaning of life. Buddhism is really what the only sensible thing to do with one's life. And if you don't take it all the way to being a monastic, well, at least as a layperson, you do your very best to practice these teachings. So this is kind of how, when you look back into the past, and with a degree of clarity, yeah, you can see the non-self. You can start to see the conveyor belt, yeah? how you are this machine, or you are kind of part of this kind of big machinery, and you're just kind of moving on on this conveyor belt. 
I don't know if you remember, there was a, when I was young, uh, this is back in the late 1970s, a long time ago now, and I remember the first kind of, the first music I was listening to in those days was a, a ba an English band called Pink Floyd. Have you heard about Pink Floyd? English band, yeah? So I, the first kind of album I bought was Pink Floyd, The Wall, yeah? And uh, The Wall is about the school children, yeah, who kind of get, go through the, the, the meat grinder, yeah? And they come out like minced meat, and they're called kind of marching to the kind of sound of this music, yeah? There's no free will. There's a feeling of everyone kind of going through this sort of... Uh, uh, conveyor belt in a sense, right? Uh, and that's what it feels a little bit like. You become this kind of part of this bigger machinery. Uh, that's what it means, yeah? No self. Uh, and that's kind of worrying. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, uh, it has also very good consequences because if you are attuned to the reality of things, uh, you can start to make good decisions. Uh, if that is correct, and if you start to understand how conditioned you are, actually then you realize the importance of reconditioning of brainwashing and all of these kind of things yeah actually you need to be brainwashed brainwashing is not an option you will be brainwashed anyway get the good brainwashing that's really what this means and so you start to recondition yourself and of course the rest the best kind of conditioning the best kind of brainwashing is precisely the buddha's teachings why because it is a conditioning that leads to happiness it leads you out of the problem it leads you to meaning it leads you to something really worthwhile in the world. Uh, that's why this is the best kind of conditioning. Uh, most other kind of conditioning is kind of uh, bad for you usually. Uh, so uh, this is what this perception of non-self gradually leads to. Uh, you start to look out and see, actually, no, I'm not really in charge. Uh, there's some larger forces here that are more powerful than I am. Uh, actually, you have no power at all. Uh, that's the problem here. Uh. <laughs> okay. Next one now. And then you develop right view to give up wrong view. Yeah. So this is what this whole retreat in many ways is about. It's about the idea of developing right view. And uh, so there are so many aspects to right view. And uh, you can see now that many of the things, usually when we talk about right view, we talk about rebirth and kamma and all of these kind of things. And rebirth and kamma is baked into the things I have been talking about. Yeah. And, Things like impermanence and uncertainty is an uh, rebirth and kamma is a broader view of ideas like impermanence and uncertainty. So all of these things actually come together at the end of the day. Yeah. And so we just need to uh, we need to fully understand the consequences of views like rebirth. What does it really mean? And that's kind of what we have to do. And that is the hardest thing to do. And that is where your views become straightened out when you understand fully what these things are about. You contemplate rebirth, you contemplate kamma. Yeah, one, one wrong view of kamma is that sometimes people think that kamma is, means that I'm in charge of my life. I just have to make good kamma, then I'll be reborn in a happy place. Yeah, and you think you can beat the system. Yeah, it's like going to the casino, right? And beating the casino. It's like a, you can't beat the casino. Everyone knows that. That's why casinos exist. You have a casino here in Malaysia, is that right? Yeah. Up in Genting Highlands or something like that, yeah, yeah. I don't even know where they are. I'm not sure if that's a good sign for a monk. But <laughs> anyway, I no, say no more. I will stop this conversation right there. <laughs> but, but, yeah, you test. What, what was that? Huh? You're going to test your camera there? Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, so, we, so we think that we can beat the system, but you can never beat the system. The reason why there are casinos is because you can't beat them. You're guaranteed to lose money if you go to a casino. They're guaranteed. Uh, that's kind of the whole point. Uh, and uh, it's exactly the same thing with kamma. Kamma is you cannot beat the system. Uh, and the reason you can't beat it is because the kamma you are making is not up to you. Uh, it is up to the cause and conditions that work on you. And those cause and conditions are uncertain and reliable. Right now, they may be good, Next life, you have no idea what's going to be happening. Or even tomorrow, you have no idea. And so thinking that kamma kind of gets you out of this, it doesn't. Uh, it is also part of a larger system of cause and effect. Uh, it's pretty bleak, isn't it? Uh? <laughs> it's not bleak at all, because we have the way out. Yeah, This is, kind of, this is the great thing here. It's about seeing things rightly and then doing what is required as a consequence. That's really what this is about. Uh. 
All right. So this is this little sutta. I don't know if you enjoyed that sutta, but there it is anyway, whether you enjoyed it or not. Uh, now you've got it. Uh, these are the three things you should develop to give up those three things, uh, three dhammas. Uh. You see, the thing is that when you are a teacher, uh, you don't care so much about what the students want. You just care about what you like. Yeah. <laughs> so you just do the sutas that you enjoy. It's terrible, isn't it? Uh, it's going to be really bad news. Uh. But uh, I think the thing is that if you enjoy something, that usually the students will enjoy it as well. It usually goes together. Uh, so it's not entirely, I, I'm not actually that selfish, I, I promise. Uh, I really try to think what will be useful. That's kind of my, my idea. I, I'm, I'm giving monks a really bad name by all the things I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> what about the coffee? <laughs> no, I, I would never say that. You, you, you just follow your own, uh, follow your own uh, wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone. So. Um, Let's move on now. Now we come to the Giri Mananda Sutta. And uh, I don't know if I have done this before here. can't remember uh, exactly. Uh, um, this is a sutta found in the uh, Anguttara Nikaya 10, the 10th chapter of the Anguttara, the numerical discourses of the Buddha, sutta number 60. And this is about a monk called Giri Mananda. And Giri Mananda means the bliss on the hill. That's a strange name, isn't it? Bliss on the hill. Mountain or hill? Yeah, Giri, kind of hill or mountain. There's two words, Pabata and Giri, two words for hill or mountain. Ananda means kind of happiness, yeah? So Giri Mananda, bliss on the hill. So I think we just call it Giri Mananda. I think that's easier, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he was, we'll see soon, this is a, a kind of a very unique sutta. It is, I don't think it has any parallels in any other schools of Buddhism. It doesn't exist in uh, Chinese translation or in Sanskrit or Tibetan or anything like that. It only exists in the Pali suttas. Uh, uh, and this sutta is what they call a paritta. Yeah, you know the parittas? Uh, the parittas are like blessing suttas. If someone is sick or someone is ill or someone has died, you often do parittas. Uh, these are things that, you know, when, they, uh, when you contemplate them, they, the idea is to help you in a certain way. Yeah? And uh, there are some uh, interesting paritas that the Buddha himself seems to have laid down. One is called the Kanda Parita. It's found in the uh, uh, Anguttara Nikaya 4, something like that. Uh, and this is the chanting that you do when you, uh, if you don't want to be bitten by snakes or scorpions and things. Yeah. So, and what that chant says, it says that... Uh, I have metta for all the snakes, I have metta for all the creatures, uh, yeah? And because you have metta for all of them, you can't just say it, you have to have it as well, right? Uh, then they don't bite you, because they look after you instead. Uh. This is called the Kanda Parita. Which number, which number sutta is that again? Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? It's called Kanda, par Kanda Parita, I think. Kanda, Ahi, Ahi, well, certainly Ahi, because snakes, yeah. So that would be... Uh, I rely 100% on Yin to be able to find, my, find the suttas. <laughs> so far, very reliable. I'm very impressed, actually. I, I think, yeah. So. In, in Thailand as well, right? Very common. Yeah. Thailand, exactly. Yeah. In Sri Lanka. And, right. Yeah. Which one? Kanda Preta. Okay, yeah. So it is, uh, it's nice in that way. So sometimes in the monastery, we chant it also sometimes in Bodhinyana Monastery as well. Yeah. So that is one sutta, one parita. Another parita that you find is canonical, you find in the suttas, is the Bojanga parita. That is the seven factors of awakening. Yeah? And so when you, if you ever go to hospital and the monks come and chant for you, probably they chant the Bojanga parita. Yeah? Probably what they chant. Yeah. What is the Bojanga parita? Seven factors, exactly. Seven factors of awakening, right? The Bojangas, yeah, exactly. So these are the seven factors of awakening. Yeah. That's kind of interesting, isn't it, that you should chant the seven factors of awakening to help people get better. Isn't that kind of fascinating? Yeah. And in the suttas, you find the same thing with the Buddha. 
the Buddha is sick, and when the Buddha is sick, he asks, I think, Mahachunda to chant the seven factors of awakening, and when they chant them, he comes out of his sickness. Uh, that's kind of really extraordinary, and you wonder, almost wonder what's going on there. It's kind of hard to really understand exactly what's going on there. But uh, maybe something like the Buddha is very weak and he's kind of sick or whatever, and he just needs someone else, and just, just needs to hear them. And when he hears them, he brings up so much joy, so much power in the mind that the sickness is just dispelled as a consequence. So when, if you are sick in hospital, and the monks come and they chant the Bodhangas and they chant in Pali, you should say, please don't chant in Pali, chant in English. Well, I can understand, yeah? But that's when you become happy because you understand that. Or whatever it is, whatever kind of language it is that you prefer to hear the suttas in that. When um, had Venerable Chunda was here last week, right? Uh, yeah, that's not that's not that's not Maha Chunda. That's just Chunda. Yeah, not Maha Chunda. Just Chunda. Yeah, yeah. Say so, Bodhidharma. Yeah, yeah. But I think Chunda. If you want, to, sometimes in the uh, here in the BGF, if you want to hear the Dhamma in like Hokkien or in Cantonese or whatever, yeah, you can ask some of these these monks who come from originally from here. Huh? You can have a Dhamma talk in Cantonese, or Hokkien. What are the main Chinese dialects here? Hokkien, Chinese? No, it's Hokkien. Teju? We have, tai, we have te, Teju. We have one monk who speaks Teju, I think. Yeah. When, venerable um, Santuti. Yeah, he speaks Teju. Huh? So anyway, that would be cool. We can have a whole panel with different, different dialects of Chinese. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Speak with them. It's kind of nice to have Dhamma in different languages. Uh, there's something about hearing the Dhamma in the language which is closest to you. Most of you are just natural English speakers, is that right? English is your first language in a sense, yeah. Uh, but there's something about, I mean, I'm Norwegian by birth, so my no Norwegian, these days I'm losing my Norwegian, so English may be my first language. So. But it's very strange, when I hear Dhamma in Norwegian, uh, it uh, has a different, different flavor to it because it's very close to your heart language. Uh. So when you hear that in the language which is closest to you, it's often much more powerful. So, uh, yeah, anyway. So it's kind of nice to have Dhamma in all kinds of different languages. Uh, but uh, we're completely losing track of the suit as we're supposed to talk about. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Did you find it, uh, Yin? 467, right. Okay, AN 467, yeah. You want to hear it? The Kandaparita? Do you, should I read it out? It's kind of, it's kind of nice little suit. Let's read it out just for fun. Let's have to do something slightly different. Yeah. 467. Sutta central discourses, uh, numerical discourses, uh, numerical discourses. Fours, uh, 67. <coughs> Chuck of these. Uh, so here you can see, yeah, here, this is the sutta right here, yeah, the snake king, see that? And so uh, while we are here, I can show you a little bit about how this website works. So, so this is the actual, this, this whole, you can see this whole, sh like a sheet almost, right? Uh, this has all the information you need about the sutta, all the various versions of the sutta. So first of all, you have the translations up here, Bhikkhu Sujato, Nisiro Bhikkhu, these are translations into English. But there's not just into English. Uh, oops, that's something else. Uh, you can actually find translations in all kinds of languages. Uh, so let's, for example, down here you have translations, yeah? And so look at that. Uh, so the top one there, I think, is uh, Devanagari. Is that Devanagari? Uh, Lina, do you know De Devanagari? Uh, no. Do you, is, I think this is Devanagari, the top one there. It has that line, everything kind of, I'm not sure. Yeah, so Sanskrit, exactly, that's Devanagari, yeah, Devanagari, that's. Uh, Ashin, this is, uh, what language, I don't know what language that is. Uh, Ashin is the name of the person who's translated. Then we have German, yeah, another one in German. Then we have Bahasa Indonesia translation, yeah, Italian. Then we have Chinese translation, Chinese characters. Is it Japanese? Ah, oh, these are Japanese characters there. Ah, aha, Nihon. Okay, okay, thank you for correcting me. Some of these are the same, right? Whether it's Chinese or Japanese, yeah. Then we have uh, Myanmar characters. Uh, then we have Portuguese. Uh, then we have Prishnuk. <laughs> is it? Are you sure? It is certainly Cyrillic characters. It could be Russian, yeah. You may be right, Russian, yeah. Then we have Sinhala characters. Then we have Swedish, yeah. Then we have Thai. 
Siam Rat, then we have Vietnamese, then we have Chinese. Yeah, this is Chinese right here. Isn't that kind of cool? It's amazing. This is super central. This is why this website is so awesome. So many languages, right? Uh, it's really kind of, uh, kind of great. And then, so that's the different languages. Then you have, the, this is the original Pali version right there, Mahasangita Tipitika Buddha Vasse. So this is the Pali version here. And then you have another very interesting thing, which is down here, parallels. And these are parallels in ancient languages, yeah? That go back thousands of years, some of them. Are. So here you have a translation. This is a, a fragment in, in Sanskrit language that was found in the Central Asia about 100 years ago and had been sitting in the cave there for over a thousand years and was brought out by this German guy called Waldschmidt and they put it together. And then you have a, uh, this is a, a Chinese translation into ancient Chinese, yeah, the Middle Chinese. This is in the Taisho, T stands for Taisho edition of the Tipitaka. This is a Japanese edition. In the Japanese, they are the most famous for collecting the ancient Chinese Tipitakas. The Japanese did that. Um, and then we have down here, these are actually parallels in, in the Pali language. It's a bit different. Uh, so this is, uh, this is this awesome website called Suda Central. Uh, this has been, this is the uh, life's work of Bhante Sujato. Uh, and so if that burns down, he, uh, we will test his uh, equanimity to see if he deals with it or not. Uh, <laughs> so this is, on, this is the actual Sutta. Yeah? So here you have Pali. This is another thing about this. Website, we can get Pali and Sanskrit, next, Pali and translation next to each other, right? But you don't have to. You can, if you want to, you can just have the English. So go plain, and you just have the English. So this is what you're supposed to chant if you are afraid of snakes. Yeah? Mendicants are urged to spread a mind of love to the four royal snake families for your own safety, security, and protection. And this is what you're supposed to chant, but you also have to have the metta, right? It's not enough just to do the chanting here. I love the virupakas, the erapatas, I love. I love the chabiaputas, the kanhagotamakas, I love. I love the four-footed creatures, I love two-footed, I love. I love the four-footed and the many-footed, I love. May the footless not harm me, may I not harm be harmed by the two-footed. May the four-footed not harm me, may I not be harmed by the many-footed. All sentient beings, all living beings, all creatures, everyone, may they only, may they see only nice things. <coughs> may bad not come to anyone. The Buddha is immeasurable, the teaching is immeasurable, the Sangha is immeasurable, but limited are the crawling things. Snakes and scorpions, centipedes, spiders, lizards and mice. I've made this safeguard. I've made this protection. Go away, creatures. <laughs> and so I revere the Blessed One. I revere the seven perfected awakened Buddhas. But it's a nice thing. You can't do love and you can get that. Go away. Metta from a distance. <laughs> That's not real metta, right? It's a bit, yeah. You're right, a bit, a bit dodgy. <laughs> okay, let's, let's try this in practice, okay? Let's do some meditation and send some metta to the snakes and see what happens. So. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So, uh, any more uh, discussion points? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ajahn, hmm. uh, about the uh, Ahiraja uh, Sutta, uh, I, I mean, when we chant the, the Sutta and we do not know what those four classifications of the snakes Right, and it does not correspond to the modern taxonomy. And I mean, if you don't, you, you don't know what you are chanting. Does right. it even work? 
<laughs> because you you don't know what those four snakes are, and yeah. then it doesn't doesn't still work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, then you yeah. what what am I chanting chanting for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in India, <laughs> I will just change the names a little bit, right? So that's kind of the, the so just have to figure out the snakes' names in in, in Malaysia and Australia. Yeah, I, I think the I think some of the idea here is that uh, I think some of the animals in the world they are kind of uh, they are like sort of lower devas that are in charge of some of these animals, uh, and so what you're actually asking is not actually the animals themselves, but you're kind of I think you're asking for some spirits that are, you know, in control of these animals and have some kind of say over how they move and these kind of things. Uh, and uh, those um, kind of higher and um, higher deities or whatever, they are going to be the same everywhere. So it doesn't really matter. So you just have to kind of think of it in that way, perhaps, uh, and then you are might be okay. Uh, so um, yeah. So I, I I don't know. It's, it's kind of it's a little bit hard to say. But uh, I think one of the principles of the Dhamma is that. Uh, you know, if you are a good person, the devas will look after you. Yeah, this is one of the principles of the Dhamma. And so, because the devas, they want more people to be reborn in the deva loka, whatever, and they're already happy with you when you are pure. And so sometimes you have things like guardian angels and these kind of things. Yeah. And so I think what you what we are doing here really is we're calling upon those guardian angels to look after us. So I think that's actually what we're doing. Yeah? And so you don't actually get bitten by that, and maybe also not get run over by a car. Yeah, that may be more relevant, perhaps, than being bitten by a snake. Yeah, so you can maybe add a few lines on not being run over by a car in there, and then uh, add that to it. So, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, sorry, Ajahn, just a quick comment. Hmm. Uh, I lie when I say I don't know Devanagari. Devanagari is a script which refers to uh, quite a lot of languages, hmm. uh, and it includes Hindi and Sanskrit. Hmm. And obviously, being an Indian, Hindi is my native language, hmm. and we are taught Sanskrit in school, hmm. uh, which is very close to Pali as well. So yeah. that was one comment I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, second thing was that I don't know what your opinion is about chanting. Um, um, and a lot of my friends ask me uh, that as a practicing Buddhist, what are your views on chanting? Uh, um, so for me, uh, we do uh, Garimanan chanting and uh, Ratna Sutta chanting very often when we are sick. Yeah. We also do Dhamma Chaka, Pavatna Sutna and Anatta Lakran Sutta chanting. Okay. We do Khan Parita and Mor Parita chanting and yeah. Jinja Parita chanting wow. very often. So these three <laughs> we do very often. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, and I'm speaking from my personal experience that I have very severe chronic debilitating pain, which doesn't, uh, um, it's not resolved by any medication. Yeah. Uh, so I don't listen to Grimananda Sutta just so that my pain should be relieved. Hmm. I just listen to it. And it's amazing. 80% of the times I don't hmm. expect it, but the pain is gone. Okay. So I just wanted to share that. All thank right. you, Ajahn. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. That's great. So, uh, yeah, so we, we have now, it's for, for sure that we had the Banagari script, so that's kind of, that's nice to know. Uh, and, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, um, anyone else? No? Yeah. Okay, this, this is, uh, 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 Denver's last day, so he might, he might give, him a, give him a chance to ask the last question. So, and then you yeah. talked about the uh, impermanence and to contemplate uh, that can you explain a little bit how how do I go about to how actually, to go about contemplating yeah, death? Then? Yeah. So the 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 important point is to to know that um, first the first thing you can do is to contemplate. Well, what what do you think it would be like to be on your deathbed? Yeah, that's kind of the first contemplation. Uh, what would it be like when you are actually going to die? Uh, and uh, sometimes I do a little bit of a guided meditation, like pretending that you are on your deathbed. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that if you really are on a deathbed, uh, then you realize that you have to let go of things. You can't hold on to anything in this world. Yeah? And so uh, you get into this habit, this mood, this mode of the mind uh, where you learn to let go because you, there is no choice when you're on your deathbed. Uh, and so that is kind of one starting point to that, just doing that as an imagination. Uh. But then you realize why wait until the day you die? Why not get the benefit now? Yeah. Why not get the benefit now of that what's going to happen when you die? And because when you die, when you're on the deathbed, because you know that there's nothing worth holding on to, uh, you let go, you will actually notice that people who are um, skilled at dying, so to speak, yeah, yeah, 
because we have all died many times before. Some are more skilled than others. Uh, so if you are <laughs> if you are skilled at dying, you become very peaceful. Yeah, and the reason is because you're actually letting go. Uh, and normally we hold on to so many things. We think about all the things in this world. We get upset about things. But on your deathbed, this world doesn't matter anymore. So there's nothing to think about. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. There's no future. There's nothing at all. And so you let go. And so instead of waiting till the time we die, get that benefit now. Yeah? This is kind of the idea with death contemplation. You bring it into the present. Uh, and so one of the ways of doing that is to realize that uh, uh, you have no idea actually when you're going to die. Yeah? Yeah? We tend to think it is in the future sometime, but it could be at any time. Uh, and so if you are going to be ready when you actually die, the only time you can be ready is now. Uh, because it could happen next moment. Uh, and if you're not ready now, then when it actually happens, chances are you will not be ready. But now is the only time to be ready. And once you kind of get that, and once that really sinks in, then you can actually do the death contemplation. I could die now. Now is the time to be ready. If I walk into the street afterwards, who knows what's going to happen? And you make that real, the fact that you could die straight away. And then these things that you, happens on your deathbed, it happens now instead. And so you can use this as a starting point in your meditation practice, yeah? So for example, if you feel very restless or you feel that your mind doesn't become peaceful or whatever, do a little bit of death contemplation. Uh, because death, ideally, if it works right, it helps you to let go. And all the restlessness and all of these kinds of things, they are a result of holding on. Uh, and so you use that to help you letting go. And as many of these kind of little contemplations, I had the same thing with the idea of impermanence, exactly the same thing, because it's just a, it's a particular way of, you know, death contemplations as a, a species of impermanence contemplation. They all have a similar kind of effect on you. Huh? So learning to let go is a critical thing. We need to do things that help us in that way. And death contemplation is very powerful. Huh? And it can make you very peaceful if you get it right. Huh? So remember, now is the time to be ready. Huh? If I'm not ready now, I probably will never be ready. Now is the only opportunity here. I could actually be dead when I leave this building here. I could fall down the stairs. Yeah, people do that. People die falling down stairs. This happens in the world. There are still snakes around in Malaysia, right? You go out and you maybe, actually, those, those, those metal snakes on the road are much more dangerous. So, <laughs> so those metal snakes, bang, they go into you, and that's, that's it. You're finished. Or something happens. Yeah, you don't know. And so that is how you, how you come, come do that. Go about this, uh, yeah.